دلم اسرت کربلا آه کربلا 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 which means whoever exits one's house emigrating towards Allah and his messenger and then is overtaken by death certainly his reward is upon Allah and this verse has an external meaning and Imam Khomeini has spoken and explored its esoteric dimensions in the book Adab al Namaz. The external meaning is very straightforward. There are people being oppressed, they can't practice their religion, they flee their homes to go and live somewhere where they can practice in accordance with Allah's rules. If on the way, whilst emigrating, death overtakes them, they will be rewarded. That's the external meaning. However, the Quran has many esoteric dimensions, each verse. In relation to the esoteric dimensions, only the ma'asum can open it up. No one but the ma'asum. And we have from the Mansumin, the Infallibles, we have many commentaries of the esoteric dimensions of various verses. Now, if a non Mansum wants to explore the esoteric dimensions, that's permissible. But they can only say, maybe this is the meaning. They can never say it's definitively the esoteric dimension of that verse. In relation to the external verses of the Qur'an, the external meanings, which we call tafsir of the Qur'an, there no one can give their own opinion. That's something specific. We have to go to the occasions of revelation and then study them. Each verse, the superficial meaning, we we'll look at the context and then on a par with the context and the history surrounding it, we explain them. No one can give their own opinion there. You can't speculate. And that's tafsir al and that's haram. But in relation to the esoteric dimensions, there's no limitation here. However, we can never definitively say, this is the meaning, but we can explore. In relation to the esoteric dimensions, the purpose is the elimination of one's ego. It's an foresee. The interpretation esoterically of those verses ought to be done in a manner which leads to the elevation of the Song Samri and the elimination of one's ego. Now here Imam Khomeini has given his understanding in relation to this verse. Mayakharuj min baytihi, whoever leaves one's house with assistance from other traditions from the Ahlul Bayt, Bayt 
which superficially means house, the prima facie meaning, is used to indicate the nafs, the soul. And we see this in other traditions of the Ahlul Bayt. Imam is using help from those traditions <coughs> and exploring the esoteric dimensions of this verse. Whoever exits one's nafs, whoever exits one's ego, whoever eliminates traces of one's ego, muhajiran ila Allah, whilst wayfaring towards Allah and His Messenger. You need to perform spiritual wayfaring in order to eliminate all traces of the ego. That I has to be controlled. Thumma yudrik hul maut, and then death overtakes them. Now this death overtaking one after wayfaring towards Allah is a sign that one's ego has been eliminated. Remember the, the verse, the, the, the tradition from the Holy Prophet, I think I mentioned this on the first night, Motu qabla an tamotu. Die before you die. Die a spiritual death before you die the physical death. Death being that ascension from one realm to a higher realm. Death meaning that acquiring one step proximity towards Allah. If you eliminate the ego whilst wavering towards Allah, then you will die. Thumma yudrik hul maut. You will ascend to higher realms. And verily, your reward will be upon Allah. That's the unforeseen interpretation that he gives. Because not all people who flee their homes will be guaranteed this reward from Allah. Not all those people who become shaheed in different wars are guaranteed reward from Allah. It depends on their inner state. It's possible that the person was weak, had no faith, was weak in faith, but he participated in a war. That doesn't guarantee the reward. The essential criterion is within. What emanates in the domain of action depends on one's inner status. Whether that mutu, tabla and tamutu was realized. Now, so how do we wayfare towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The short answer is we have to acquire taqwa. But taqwa is a very broad term. It has many different meanings. It has many different dimensions to it. There are many steps to acquiring taqwa. I want to mention some of them for you tonight. The most basic step in acquiring taqwa and the most essential step, the first step if you like, in acquiring taqwa well, Tagwa means being immune. That's the literal definition. Being immune. And whenever you read the word Tagwa, it has two aspects to it. There's one aspect that, it, that is refraining in nature. You have to refrain from something. And there's one aspect that you have to control yourself with something. So every time you come across Tagwa, whatever dimension of Tagwa, there's a refraining element to it, and there's a controlling element to it. In the first step of taqwa, it's a case of refraining from the canonical sins, the shari sins, be they major sins or minor sins, doesn't matter. You have to refrain from them. And then you have to control yourself by doing the wajibat. This is the most elementary but most essential step to taqwa. This has to be perfected. Everything else in your spiritual wayfaring has to be based on this scaffolding. So here, you don't need an ustad in this 
phase. You follow your marja, who tells you what the wajibat and the muharramat are. But this is only the first step. Someone may do all the wajibat and refrain from all the muharramat, but they may be poor in ethics still. It's possible. They may be poor in spirituality. They never sin. And they do all the wajibat. But still, in ethics and irfan, they're lacking. Now this has to be explained to it. There are many actions which are called ethical sins. They're not shari'i, canonical sins. You won't be punished for these sins in the hereafter. However, these ethical sins do contaminate your heart as you perform them. But they're not shari'i sins. Being jealous is not a canonical sin, unless you express it. Or holding on to grudges isn't a sin from the Sharia point of view. But in the ethical point of view, it is. And by an ethical sin, I just mean certain actions which contaminates one's heart. Now, if this contamination leads to a certain threshold, it will make you more susceptible to <coughs> commit those shari sins. That's why it's important. Then there are things called Irfani sins. And what are they? Here, if you love a car, if you love a big house, you love something <coughs> which is distancing you from the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not a Sharia sin. It's not an ethical sin either. But it's called an Irfani sin. There's no fire associated with it, but it contaminates the heart. The heart, there's only one, and it's only to be occupied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِ Allah hasn't assigned in anyone two hearts. It's one heart. That one heart has to be occupied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's occupied with a nice car, a nice house, a nice center, a nice X, Y, or Z, in proportion to that occupation, you've lessened your affinity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't love both. That's an Irfani sin. That too contaminates one's heart at a higher degree, but it's not a Shari sin. But that contamination of the heart, if it reaches a certain threshold, it makes you susceptible to ethical sins and, in effect, makes you susceptible to shabby sins one day along the line. The reason why some people are very strong in faith once upon a time, we think they're strong because they do own the Vajibat and they refrain from the Muharramat. And we say they're very strong. But whilst we think they're very strong, their Irfani sins or ethical sins are dominating over them. But we still we only see the faith that they have. One day though, after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, it doesn't matter. Once that contamination by means of the ethical and Irfani sins predominates, they will be made more susceptible to shari sins and they will fall. So really no one can be complacent in relation to one's faith. So that was the first step and that is taqwa of refraining from the sins and doing the vajibat. Another step in taqwa is where you refrain from riya I'm not sure of a proper translation for Riyah. Maybe ostentation or... I'll explain it in a minute. And controlling yourself with Ikhlas. 
being a mukhlis, not a mukhlas yet, being a mukhlis, dedicating your actions for Allah. The mukhlas is something else. I'll come to that inshallah later, maybe tomorrow. Here, you refrain from riya and you control yourself by being a mukhlis, having ikhlas, dedicating your actions for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, riya in relation to the ibadat, such as salat, fasting, and so on and so forth, is haram. So this isn't a riya which we want to focus on, because that riya was dealt with in step one, where you have to refrain from the sins. This riya here is in relation to the non-ibadat. Drinking, driving, studying, helping people, things which are not part of the, the, five, the five or six actions of worship, the salat, the fasting, hajj. Their riya is haram. But in relation to eating, in relation to helping someone out, in relation to driving to school, in relation to working, in relation to marrying, Riyadh there isn't Haram. But now you want to grow in Taqwa now. If you master the first step, now you can try and refrain from Riyadh even in relation to the non ibadat Doing it for Allah's sake, bringing Allah in the picture somehow. One has to use one's own initiative. And one can't do everything from day one. It's a gradual process. You have to grow in you know, action by action. Every week you get stronger and stronger. You can focus on one action at a time. And here you can easily evaluate yourself as to whether you are doing things for Allah's sake or not. For example, you lend someone money and they don't give it you back. Or when you ask for them to lend you money, they don't give you money. You lend them money. But when you ask them to give you money, they refuse. And you become disappointed. That's because when you lend them money, it wasn't done for Allah's sake. You invited someone to your house, but they never invited you. You get disappointed. That was because when you invited them, it wasn't for Allah's sake. You did it for yourself. You wrote a scientific article, a paper. Then someone stole your name and put their own name on that paper. And you get disappointed. I mean, they've done you wrong. You can retaliate, that's okay. But why are you becoming disappointed? Because that paper, when you wrote it, it wasn't for Allah's sake. You marry, you do, you do your research, you marry, and the husband or the wife turns out to be negative. Not as, as you expected, it doesn't matter. Why are you disappointed? You didn't marry for Allah's sake. And then you quickly always think of divorce. But divorce must be a last resort. One has to escape from divorce. Divorce means the end of one's spirituality in most cases. So here in this step, it's important that one makes an effort that outside the ibadat, in one's daily routine, there's 10 or 20 actions one does every day, bring Allah into the picture. When you're brushing your teeth, bring Allah's attributes. Allah is musawwir, for example, the shape of beauty. He is mutahir. Play with Allah's attributes. And with practice then, with every action, Allah will be there for you. Another step in Tango is refraining from multiplicity and controlling oneself with unity. So what does this mean? In this world of all these thousands and millions of different causes that we have in this world, this book is a cause, this microphone, the car, this carpet, food, 
all these different causes that we see, one must only see that one true cause. We only believe in one cause. Everything else in this world is an effect. It's not a cause, but we see them as causes. Only Allah is the sole self-sufficient cause. It's all Allah's attributes at play. But we get drowned in the superficial, in quotes, causes, thinking they are causes. So here, when you drink water, we usually think the water is quenching our thirst, but Allah is the quencher. When we go to the doctor, we get drowned in the doctor, thinking the doctor cured us, but Allah is the curer. Although we thank the doctor, we, we maintain the adab and etiquette, but we get drowned in the doctor, and we forget Allah, but Allah is the curer. See, in this step of taqwa, refraining from multiplicity, X, Y, Z being the causes, maintaining oneself, controlling oneself, with unity, there's one cause, and that's Allah. You're eating food, Allah is not them. You go to the grocery, buy some fruits, Allah is raziq, but you thank the grocers, there's no problem there. You put the alarm on your car, set it on, but Allah is half head. In all these actions that you do, moment to moment, we get drowned in those causes, in the alarm, in the grocery, in the food, in the water, in the doctor, in the teacher. But Allah is alim. And by getting drowned in the physical, superficial causes, we forget the real cause. Here, there's one aspect of wudu, when we do our wudu, there's one aspect of it which reminds us of this, that we want to wash ourselves off these different causes and recall Allah as the true cause. And that's when you wash your hands from the elbow joint downwards, the elbow joint being symbolic of a cause, we rely upon it. It's a joint. And we wash ourselves from all causes in this world, recalling only Allah as the true cause. And look, this is only one aspect of wudu. If this is truly incorporated within us, look at the spirituality that is maintained by doing wudu. But if you suffice with the minimum, the letter of the law in wudu, that's really, you're missing the point. You won't be elevating yourself spiritually by doing the wudu. You've just done the letter of the law. It didn't have any meaning to it though. Now there's one hadith I want to read. And this is very good, a practical step. The ulama have brought this in their books, that's why I'm giving it to you. But I don't want you to burn yourselves out with this. I usually don't give people steps to do because I'm not at that level or anything. And even the committee here, they wanted to, me to speak about Salat or Layl. I'm not for that really. Because Salat or Layl requires a strong scaffolding before you do it. Most people suddenly get burnt out doing Salat or Layl. They don't know how to do it properly. And then the consequences can be everlasting. Here, this step I'll give you, you have to, I'll tell you how to do it when I finish the hadith. The hadith reads, Man ahdatha wa lam yatawadda faqad jafani. Whoever's wudu becomes nullified, the state of wudu becomes cancelled. For example, one goes to the lavatories, or the other things which leads to one's wudu being <coughs> invalid. But this happens, and one doesn't perform the wudu straight after, 
Now this is a secret tradition. Haditha would see, and Allah is saying this. It's narrated from the Holy Prophet. It's the words of the Holy Prophet. But it was after him ascending, receiving that divine knowledge, then he was using his own words. Whereas in the Quran, he doesn't use his own words. And that's the difference between Haditha Qudsi and the Quran. So Allah says, whoever, whoever's wudu is nullified, and they don't do the wudu, they have abandoned me. Allah is saying this. They have shunned me. Now, the reason will be evident at the end. وَمَنْ أَهْدَثَ وَتَوَذَّأَ وَلَمْ يُصَلِّ رَكْأَتَيْنْ فَقَدْ جَفَوْنِي And whoever's wudu is nullified, and they do the wudu after that nullification, but they don't pray two units of prayer, they have abandoned me. Allah is saying this. وَمَنْ أَهْدَثَ وَتَوَذَّرَ وَسَلَّوْ رَكْأَتَيْنِ وَلَمْ يَدْعُنِي فَقَدْ جَفَانِي Their wudu has become nullified. They do the wudu, they do the two units of prayer, but they don't supplicate before Allah. They have abandoned me again. However, وَمَنْ أَهْدَثَ However, if someone, after their wudu, their state of wudu has become <coughs> nullified, they do their wudu straight afterwards. They do two units of prayer, and then they supplicate before Allah, after the two units of prayer. And then Allah says, I, and if I don't answer to their supplication, be it in relation to matters of the dunya, or the deen, or spiritual matters, verily I would have abandoned them, and I am not an abandoning Lord. Has to bear up in job. Here, the tradition ends here. Why should wudu be so spiritually elevating? Why should wudu have such a capacity that if you go through the different steps after doing the wudu and then supplicate after the two units, whatever you want especially in spiritual matters, Allah will give. It can't be just because of the physical action. You see, that's where we fail usually. This extremely high potential that Wudu has for your deen, for your dunya, is if you comply with the esoteric dimensions of the Wudu. One of them was just always recalling that not being drowned in these physical causes and seeing Allah as the true cause. This makes you grow. Every step of the wudu, and the wudu may have 10 or 20 components to it. Not all of them are wajib. Most of them may be mustab, but there's a reason behind them. Inhaling water through the nose, there's something there. It's a conduit to a spiritual matter. Every action is a root to something esoteric, which is spirit building. And therefore we have to pay attention to it. If you just suffice with the letter of the law, it's a minimum. And you may be given a heaven, that's okay. But our potential is much more. The same with us. I'm not sure if I've recited this tradition here before, but we have a tradition that whoever recites, whoever executes, sorry, the Friday Qus on 40 consecutive Fridays, 
there, their corpse will be preserved, their body will be preserved. And there are many instances that this has happened in history. But one instance which I personally have yaqeen, but some, sometimes they may exaggerate in different personalities. But this person which I have yaqeen, because I've heard it from different sources to whom I trust, was the father of the former Prime Minister of Iran, Bani Sad. His father was a very religious man. Now, Bani Sad himself, I don't know what happened, but his father was very good. He was an Ayatollah Bani Sad in Hamadan. All the Hamadanis loved him, everyone there. In the time of the Shah, he was very against all the oppressions that were going on. He, was, he stuck always to his position. When they wanted to bury Sayyid Mustafa Khomeini in Najaf, they saw that his body was preserved. And he had always said for people to practice this. And he, he must have done it himself. The question is, why should the body be preserved? By something doing a physical action, the horse rather, by doing the physical horse, why should the body be preserved after death? See, this is the question. There's no relationship between a physical horse and the preservation of the corpse. It never decomposes. The answer is you have to look at the esoteric dimensions of the horse. All our actions in the Sharia, we can reach the horse, wudu, menstruation, all these things in Tahara that you see, and other things, all of them have these esoteric meanings behind it. But we, we lack, we never see that. We don't even want to explore it. We suffice with the letter of the law. The Qos, if its esoteric dimensions are abided by, the spirit is building. This building of the spirit for 40 consecutive weeks, your nafs, your soul will be so strong that even after death, it will have a providential authority, a providential velayat, over the material realm. Even though you're dead, you have some control in this realm over your own body. And it never decays. So that we have to pay attention to these dimensions of our religion too. I think I have another five minutes. Another step of taqwa is Refraining from isolation and controlling oneself in congregations. So refraining from living an isolated life and living rather a collective life with the people. Here we want to live with the masses. We want to live with the people. If you isolate yourself from the people, it has the potential to lead to your spiritual downfall. I'm not saying it always happens, but the potential is there. You won't grow. It's a limited form of perfection. Why should living collectively, why should living with the people be important? The answer is, because many of the divine attributes that we want to acquire, we can't acquire them if we don't live with the people. If we're not with the people, how are we going to learn to be patient? How are we going to learn to be generous? How are we going to learn to be forgiving? You have to be with the people for these divine attributes to be realized within. But if you're always isolated from the people, you're prohibiting and preventing yourself from acquiring these divine attributes. Now, there may be exceptions. There may be some people who, by living with the people, they may be compromising their faith. It's possible. And therefore, they isolate themselves. They just 
boring their own growth. There's nothing haram in doing that. Monasticism that the Christians have, it's okay. They're also great that the, the Quran has given the green light to it in relation to what, how they used to live. However, in Islam, the route to perfection is much more. It's not one's primary route of action, monasticism. But it's not haram. Although, if it leads to you doing haram, then that becomes problematic. But Islam wants you to be with the people. Prophetic tradition reads, Kun finnas wa la takun ma'ahum. Be amongst the people, but don't be with them. And what does that mean? It means you have to live with the people, you have to be amongst the people. But don't let their sins, their vicious attributes, contaminate you. Or don't acquire the color of sin to yourself from people. So be amongst them, but don't be with them. In the story of Noah, that was the reason why his son, it, what led to his downfall, what led to the downfall of Prophet Noah's son, was the fact that he was always away from the people. He didn't live with the people. That ultimately led to him refuting the message. And in the Quran, when the ark was sailing, it says, Wakana fi ma'azel. He was standing aloof, which has a physical, superficial meaning, but the esoteric meaning was he always stood aloof from the people, leading him to fall ultimately. Okay, I think I'll stop there. Okay, a few minutes of Zikr Masiba. On the eve of Ashura, Lady Zainab was wandering and walking around the tents, asking herself what will happen tomorrow. Hussein alayhi salam had explicitly stipulated on many occasions that death is the fate of us all. After walking around the tents, Hussein alayhi salam saw Lady Zainab smiling. Imam Hussein said, since leaving Mecca all this time, I've never seen you this happy. What's happened? Lady Zainab replied, I was walking past the tents of the companions and the tents of Bani Hashem, and then I became very happy. When I was passing the tents of the companions, I heard Habib utter words of unity and loyalty to you. Habib ibn Madahir, he was an incredible figure. When he had left Kufa for Karbala, he initially hadn't told his wife exactly where he's going. He hadn't established his wife's position in relation to the Ahlul Bayt. What had happened during that time that many wives had disclosed their husband's position on the Ahlul Bayt, either intentionally or unintentionally, leading to their husband's death by the oppressive regime at the time. And Habib didn't know, and he hid his love for the Ahlul Bayt from his wife, and he didn't know what the position of his wife was. Furthermore, he didn't want to make his wife upset and stressed that by telling her that he's going to Karbala, it would mean the end of Habib. So he didn't want to bother her with this information. So he told his wife, I'm going to see a few friends and comrades. Then the wife expressed her inner disposition and said, O oh, Habib, Fatima's son is entrapped in Karbala and you want to visit your friend's house? Be embarrassed, Habib. On receiving such a reply, Habib told his wife the truth. 
On hearing what Habib had to say, the wife expressed her inner identity even more by saying, I too will come with you. Habib then said, no, you may act as a barrier or impediment to my endeavors. So Habib left alone. Habib arrived in Karbala, they checked him out due to the genuine fears they all had vis-a-vis -vis Imam Hussein's security. They then informed Imam Hussein that Habib has arrived. When Habib went and sat with Hussein, Lady Zainab was informed. She didn't want to enter the tents herself, and so she found a family member, either Ali Akbar or Qasim, and told them, tell Habib that Zainab, the daughter of Ali, has sent her salams. The family member went to Habib and said, our aunt has sent her salams to you, O Habib. Now let's return to the eve of Ashura again. Zainab salam, was outside the tents of the companions. She saw Habib calling the companions and he started speaking with the companions. Habib said, O oh, Ashab, O oh, companions, what is your view about tomorrow? What's the plan? They all rose their swords and shouted, O oh, Habib, whatever you do, we shall follow suit. Habib outlined his procedure of action. He said, we should not by any means allow Bani Hashem the right to enter the battlefield first. Until we are, we will never let them enter battle, because this is bad for us. How will future generations look upon us? They all accepted. Zainab's heart was slightly made tranquil. She then progressed to the tents of Bani Hashem family that had a bait. There she heard Abbas salam, assembling the members of the Ahlul Bayt. Abbas said, O oh, Ali Akbar, O oh, Ghazim, O oh, Bani Hashim, what is your view in relation to tomorrow if war commences? They all rose their swords and exclaimed, O oh, Abbas, whatever you do, we will follow suit. Abbas then continued, we must go to the battlefield first and should not let the companions go before us. Then Abbas salam, started giving his reasons by saying, because Hussein is one of us, this will be bad for us to stay alive whilst the companions die for our master and our father. We must die for Hussein first. They all agreed. During the Battle of Ashura on the 10th of Muharram, Habib was in charge of the army's left flank. He was constantly under complete composure the whole period. However, things were soon to change. Halfway into the battle, Abu Thumama as Sa'idi looked up into the sky's horizon and observed that the time for the Zuh Salat has arrived. O oh, Hussein, it's time to pray, he exclaimed. The Imam said, you've reminded us of the Salat. May Allah assign you with the status of the Musalli. Ask for a temporary truce so that we may execute our Salat. When this was suggested to the enemy, Hassim <coughs> ibn Tamim said, and now Allah Tukban, your Salats aren't accepted. Habib got infuriated and replied, do you really think that the salons of the family of the progeny of the Holy Prophet won't be accepted, but yours will, O donkey? Have you seen the vision, the true essence of this enemy of Allah as a donkey in essence? Hasim then reacted to this comment of Habib's. He started an attack on Habib. Habib struck Hassim's horse's face with his sword. The horse fell and Hassim followed, lying on the earth. However, Hassim was then immediately escorted away by a number of soldiers. The battle continued. Habib, with his old age, managed to stay firm. He killed 62 soldiers, but eventually he was struck by the sword of Badil ibn Surayn. 
He was then pierced with another soldier's spear. He fell down. He wanted to stand up, but Hasin was there in the waiting and struck his sword with all his power through Habib's head. Habib fell over again face first. The Tamimi soldier then approached Habib, came over Habib and amputated his head. When the Imam came upon Habib's body, it was difficult for Imam Hussein to cope with such a scene. Habib was a long life disciple of Amir al Mu'minin, of the Ahlul Bayt. When Imam Hussein was a child, Habib would from afar just watch Imam Hussein move for hours and hours. Imam came upon the body of Habib. He kept uttering, Inna Allah, wa Inna ilayhi raji'oon. This was Habib, a lifelong family disciple. Oh, Habib, the Imam said, verily you used to recite the entire Quran in a single night. You were indeed one of the Salihin. Taking Habib's life was so significant for the enemy that they were quarreling as to who could take the amputated head back to Kufi. On the way back, the man in whose hands Habib's head was situated encountered a young child looking at the head with utmost precision. It was Habib's son, as my father's head. He begged to be given his father's head, but the soldier refused. But after the saga of Karbala, there was another amputated head, that of the head of Imam Hussein Imam, One of the daughters of Imam Hussein, Ruhaya, came across the head. She asked for the head, but in this scenario, the animal gave the holy head to her. Ruhaya said, Ya Abadha, Man dalladhi aytamani ala zhar sinni. O Father, who's making an orphan at such a young age? Ruhaya saw the head very closely. She saw the fractures. She saw the bed covered in blood. She saw everything and cried out, Laytani kuntu a'ma. If only I were blind, I wouldn't see such a scene with your head. Yeah.